This is your Tech News Briefing for Friday, November 4th. I'm Julie Chang for The Wall Street Journal, filling in for Zoe Thomas. The gaming industry is going through a lot of changes right now. Growth in cloud, gaming subscriptions, NFTs. On top of that, Microsoft announced its plan to acquire Activision Blizzard earlier this year, though it hasn't been smooth sailing. The $69 billion deal caught the attention of regulators across the world. Phil Spencer, CEO of Microsoft Gaming, sat down with WSJ reporter Sarah Needleman at the Wall Street Journal's annual Tech Live conference last week. They talked about the Activision Blizzard deal, Microsoft's battle with another tech giant, Apple, over the iPhone maker's hefty commission on in-app purchases, Microsoft's long-term gaming ambitions, and more. Here are highlights from that conversation. So last time we talked about, uh, you had just purchased ZeniMax, the parent of Bethesda, which makes a bunch of great games like Fallout, Elder Scrolls. And uh, I asked you at the time if you were done on your shopping spree or if you were still shopping around. And it looks like you did make a a pretty big deal for Activision Blizzard. Not done yet. Still in regulatory. That is true. Uh, but my question is, again, are, are we done shopping or could we expect more deals for more gaming studios in the future? Well, you know, when we look at video games today, you know, over 3 billion people on the planet play video games, which is just kind of astounding. Nearly half the world's population plays video games. The business itself is a $200 billion business growing by almost double digits every year. So for us at Microsoft, we look at this category and we see a category that's in some transition where we have some legacy and franchises that matter, and we're gonna continue to invest. I think it's something where we see the opportunity, we love the community around our games and our properties and our studios, and the more we can build towards that future of more people playing, uh, I think it's it's a good business opportunity for the company and a good audience opportunity when you think about the age demographic that we attract as well. Okay, so more deals could be on the horizon. I'll keep my eyes peeled for that. So one of the major sticking points, at least in the UK, about this deal is around Activision's Call of Duty franchise. Microsoft has said that it plans to continue making that franchise available on all the different platforms. Yes, we do. Yep. Uh, but you haven't said for how long or for how much. I mean, could this change at some point? Could a couple of years down the road you say it's exclusive to Xbox Game Pass or it's exclusive for people who want to stream it, but if you want to buy it on a disc, you could play it on, say, PlayStation? That's not our plan. Our plan is that Call of Duty specifically would be available on PlayStation is what you're asking about. But when I think about our plans, I'd love to see it on the Switch. I'd love to see the game playable on many different screens. But if we circle back to why this deal is important to us, when you're spending the amount that we're spending, looking at the opportunity in gaming, this opportunity is really about mobile for us. And I know, as you said, most of the dialogue that's out there has been around consoles and how Xbox and PlayStation consoles compete Mm -hmm. with each other. But when you think about 3 billion people playing video games, there's only about 200 million households that play on console. A vast majority of the people who play, play on the device that's already in their pocket, which is their phone. The thing that made us really interested in Activision Blizzard King was the great work that the teams there had done in building such large mobile followings. A lot of that with the King studio that they have with Candy Crush, which is a big franchise a lot of people know. But also if you look at Call of Duty Mobile, which to me actually in the strategic rationale behind this deal is more interesting than what's happening on console between Xbox and PlayStation with this franchise that will continue to ship on PlayStation. Natively, we don't, mm-hmm. it's not a plan of, okay, we're gonna bait and switch somebody where they gotta play on the cloud or that at two or three years we're gonna pull the game. Our intent is that we would continue to ship Call of Duty on PlayStation as long as that made sense, mm-hmm. you know, as long as like, tech is always in some form of transition. But this deal for us really centered around our opportunity to get more mobile engagement in Xbox Mm -hmm. and the great work that the teams had done there. One of the things that came out through the antitrust investigations is that Microsoft is looking to expand its Xbox store to mobile devices. And I'm wondering, how is that possible since Apple doesn't allow third parties to operate stores on the iPhone and iPad? So is this a a fantasy? How are you going to get around this? Well, it's definitely true today that the largest gaming platform on the planet, which is a mobile phone, is controlled by two companies, Google and Apple. And not only do they have the storefronts, whenever somebody tells you to go find an app, 
its discovery, its monetization, its search in many ways. People go to the stores to search. And we have to find a way to create more engagement and monetization for us in mobile. It's imperative for our business. There's no way that you succeed as a gaming company if you don't have access to mobile players. So how do we do that? I think it's, it's multifaceted. We have to break that duopoly of only two storefronts available on the largest platforms. If you look at Windows as an example, there's a multitude of storefronts available on Windows, and I think that creates healthy competition. We've also invested a lot in our cloud streaming, where we're able to today stream Xbox games to the phone through the internet, and that works. It's not native to the phone, so it's, uh, there's a little more friction that the platforms put in place for us actually getting to our customers. Microsoft supported Epic Games, the maker of Fortnite, in its battle against Apple over the App Store's 3% tax on digital sales. But while Microsoft said it's lowering the cut that it takes on its Xbox App Store, the company continues to take 3% on the console. How come? Yeah, consoles as a business model, one, as I said, in the overall scope of gaming, it's fairly small relative to the places that people play. Consoles evolved to a business model much different than phones, where consoles are actually sold at a loss in the market. So when somebody goes and they buy an Xbox at their local retailer, we're subsidizing that purchase somewhere between $100 and $200 with the expectation that we will recoup that investment over time through accessory sales and storefront. Mobile phones are not sold at a loss. Mobile phones are profitable. They're general purpose computing devices. And much more like Windows, I think it should be a platform that's open. And as you said, on Windows, we have reduced our royalty because we look at Windows as a profitable business for us and we want it to be a place where creators and players meet. And you mentioned Epic. I think it's telling that Apple, at the result of Epic raising a complaint, what did they do? They threw out the largest game in the world from their store. How has Microsoft's conversation with Apple evolved since that lawsuit and that trial? Has Apple shown any openness at all in maybe allowing cloud gaming? Uh, what Apple specifically asked us to do was to use the web browser, which we've done. So if you, you can use the Safari web browser on a phone. It's not the natural place people go to find games, but it does work today. And we have Fortnite available on iOS phones, not an ad, but that is the way you can play on iOS phones is through our streaming technology on the phones. But there's so much friction going from somebody tells you, hey, you should go play this game, you should go find this new app. Nobody thinks to go to a web browser and then search for it. So it's, there's so much work for us to do to overcome the friction. And on and Android, we actually do have an app in the store. We're just not able to monetize. All right. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. And that's it for Tech News Briefing this week. We had editorial support from Falana Patterson. Our supervising producer is Chris Zinsley. And I'm Julie Chang, filling in for our host, Zoe Thomas. Thanks for listening and have a great weekend. <laughs>